Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, uh, it's lovely to see you here uh, on this beautiful sunny Monday. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the fifth British Library Lab Symposium here in the Knowledge Center. And I was just conferring, um, and I think this is probably the biggest turnout we've had yet. So um, fifth and, and hopefully the best. Um, so I'm Adam Farquhar. I'm head of digital scholarship here at the British Library. I'm also principal investigator for the British Library Labs, which is generally, generously supported by the Andrew uh, W. Mellon Foundation. And each year, um, this symposium has brought together an amazing set of innovative people in the audience, um, that's you, uh, as well as some uh, great speakers and some opportunities to highlight some uh, really lovely work that's been done um, either in the last year, actually in previous years, that have highlighted and made use of the digital collections and data that the British Library holds. Our goal in the labs, um, uh, and generally in the digital scholarship department, is, is to do just that, right? It's to highlight um, and stimulate the innovative use of digital collections and data um, here at the library. And, you know, this is our, our national collection, and it represents many years of investment. And we've been working with researchers and artists and more to unleash um, that investment and produce um, real value from it, creating new knowledge, uh, beautiful artwork, and uh, remarkable innovations. And over the last year, I think we've engaged with hundreds of people um, up and down the UK, and we've also um, uh, shared our digital collections with millions around the world. So that by way of introduction, really welcome. I think it's gonna be a, a, a great interesting day and a, a really exciting uh, treat at the very end. Um, but to start, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Josie Frazier, our keynote speaker. Um, she's a senior technology advisor at the UK government's department for uh, culture, media, and sport. Um, but she's also made uh, um, some remarkable contributions in the use of technology and digital information. She's led some uh, major initiatives around the use of technology in schools and worked to address some of the, um, the less positive side effects of our network world, uh, such as cyberbullying. She's currently chairing the Wikimedia UK, um, which I think all of us know through wiki uh, media projects, Wikidata, Wikimedia Commons, and more. And it's really in that last capacity that she's here um, to speak with us today. Uh, Josie's um, going to be discussing the impact that the open knowledge movement has had on education and learning. So please um, uh, join me in welcoming her to the podium. Very much for that gracious welcome. Okay, so um, it's great to see so many of you here today, um, and it's obviously a real, real honour to be um, speaking to you today at the British Library Labs annual symposium. Um, and I'm delighted that we've got a, a best ever turnout as well. That's fantastic. I think it's an exciting time for all of us. It's a very exciting time, particularly for the British Library and for the British Library Labs and for the cultural sector as a whole. Mainly, that's obviously because of this conference today, um, but it's also because of the increasing integration of uh, technology, um, in particular, the internet, mobile and gaming technologies into daily life and the huge opportunities that that then throws up for um, supporting interaction and access to collections and resources. There's a huge opportunity historically there. And for me, one of the really exciting things about that is not just that people can for the first time, view things that were previously um, very inaccessible or very difficult for them to reach, but actually that we are creating opportunities for people to contribute themselves to knowledge and to the knowledge base through collaboration, through um, different kinds of partnerships, through remixing um, and through sharing um, outputs as well themselves. I'm going to see if this works. Yay, okay, the other exciting thing about this year um, that some of you will be aware of is that 2007 is actually the year of open, so happy year of open, everybody. I'm sure you have been celebrating since January. It's not quite over, so for those of you flagging, you know, it's, it's not too long now, just pace yourselves a little bit more. Um, it's really important celebration of 
um, a few things, particularly the positive impact that the op open knowledge movement has had on a huge variety of areas, including um, obviously the cultural sector, but also on governments, on education, on business and research, uh, not just in the UK, although in the UK we are very, very, um, you know, I'm very proud of what we've done in the UK in terms of this area. I think we've made a huge contribution globally, but globally um, there has been massive, massive progress. What it also means is that we have a rich history um, to draw on in terms of accessing knowledge and open knowledge. This isn't a kind of a new thing. This isn't something that we have to start fresh with. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Lots and lots of people have been working very hard on, on this for a long time now, creating huge, huge resources. So it's been 15 years now since UNESCO first adopted the term open education resources. And it's been 10 years since the Ta Cape Town Declara Education Declaration, which kind of laid out uh, a roadmap for um, governments internationally to move forward in terms of how they could benefit from and how their countries and their people and how people all over the world could benefit from open education. Uh, this year, we actually had the second um, Open Education um, Congress that took place in September. And what we have now, I think, is a maturity of both discussion and organisations um, that, that is really significant. And I think this year, for me particularly, it's, it's been marked in terms of how uh, people working in open knowledge, people passionate about accessibility to resources and collections, have actually started to reflect not just on how do we get these access, how do we support technical access to things, but actually looking at the kind of broader issues such as how do we ensure our own communities are inclusive and reflective of the people we want to reach and the people that we're working with? How do we actually move forward together in terms of quite tough areas? And I'm going to talk about some of those in the, in the uh, course of this talk. So I don't know if anybody anybody here went to MozFest this weekend? Yay! Woo! Okay, it's great. Okay, so MozFest, for those of you who, who haven't been yet, um, if, if you do live in London, then definitely go along next year because it is a, it's, it's held in London every year. It's, an, it's a global festival, so we're extremely lucky to have it on our doorsteps. And it is a celebration from Mozilla um, about um, the open knowledge movement and kind of all kinds of different engagements with that. So it's a great... Um, event. Lots and lots of young people and children there this year as well, which is, is, is fantastic to see. So one of the comments that was made and one of the kind of conversations that was going around that event was around this. So the internet promised education and empowerment for all. The reality, amplifying injustice and prejudice, what happened? So I'm going to have a little look at that. Um, uh, quite a negative statement, and I don't want to misrepresent Mozilla because it is actually a very powerfully positive um, event. But I think, again, a sign of the maturity of the conversations that we're now having, that we can be self-reflective and critical about where we're going and what our communities actually look like. Um, just to reflect a little bit about the situation here in the UK, obviously globally the situation is very difficult. Here in the UK we have um, virtually all adults aged, oh thank you very much, aged 16 to 34 are now online. We have a lot less um, adults over the age of 50, uh, sorry 75, and it's 57, it's nearly me. So uh, 50, 75 uh, and over online. And we have seen increases in um, people who have recently been online. So that's people who are have been online in the last three months. And some um, m some moves forward in terms of the numbers of men versus women. So the numbers of women still is a little bit um, behind the numbers of men that are going online for a whole range of reasons. Um, and that has slightly increased, as has the number of men online. Okay. This is from my um, uh, Michel Foucault inspirational quote calendar. Uh, this is uh, Mr. 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 Foucault October. Uh, 
I'm not going to really go, I'm not going to get too sidetracked because I'm sure in this audience there are many people who have very strong opinions about post-structuralism and very strong opinions about other kind of areas of this. The reason that I've picked this slide in particular is because I am a bit of a Foucault fan, but also um, it's kind of to um, open up a conversation about the symbiotic relationship that exists between knowledge and power and to um, acknowledge that. And I think that is one of the signs of maturity that the movement is going through at the moment. So I'm going to give you the short version, non-Foucault fans. Uh, what happened to answer that question from Mozilla? So this is what I think has happened. Many of you in the audience will think uh, we'll, have, we'll have different um, understandings. And obviously, this is a very short version. So the internet is now mainstream. Technology is now part of our everyday life. Um, it's structures and supports and forms and uh, presents our identity. It is linked very closely to our relationships, both our personal relationships and our larger relationships. So our political relationships with the state, for example, um, and, with, and with other players and organisations. The internet like Soylent Green, is actually people, it turns out. And I'm really sorry if I've spoiled the end of that film for anyone. Um, just maybe take that bit off the film for later on as well. The internet is made up of people. It is not some weird space that exists outside of real life. It's actually us in a different format, in a different form. Um, digital content and relations build on and reinscribe what's going on in our world. It's not a, a magic box of uh, tricks that we can open in terms of technology and suddenly we have um, a place where everybody is really lovely to each other. That's not to say we don't have places online where everybody is very lovely to each other. We have many, many places and many very, very positive things going on online. But we also um, are kidding ourselves if we think that existing power relationships are not carried out over into those spaces and enacted in those spaces and in some times um, increased and amplified in those spaces. Um, a good example of that would probably be uh, Microsoft's Tay that some of you might be aware of. So this was an AI uh, chatbot that Microsoft um, put out um, uh, uh, quite recently, and the idea was that it would learn from people on Twitter, it would form conversations, it was kind of team focused, it was a fun AI experiment by Microsoft, but it got taken down within 16 hours, and that's because um, Tay became um, a racist, a conspiracy theorist, a sex bot, and was engaging in all kinds of inappropriate things, partly because people were trolling Trey and gaming the system, and they worked out pretty quickly that if you say horrible things to Tay, Tay will start picking that up and say horrible things back, partly because actually there is quite a lot of horrible things in those environments anyway, and they were being picked up on. So a combination of those kind of two approaches meant that... Um, we have, we, we've benefited from a lovely example of how non-neutral algorithms actually are and how non-neutral technology is and how in those spaces actually we need to be aware and we need to factor in and think about what we're putting into systems that we are imagining are neutral and what it is we're going to get out if we go in to those spaces thinking, oh, everybody's going to be lovely, it's a neutral world. And there's many, many more examples, I'm sure, um, people in the audience can think of um, that, are, that, are, that are very similar, specifically around race and gender. Um, so continuing that kind of strand and focusing for a minute on online violence against women, uh, this is from the UN... Uh, broadband commission report um, that's, that's really really interesting for anybody interested in online participation and the kind of scope of issues that are facing particular groups in this case uh, women um, the internet does not invent online violence but and the internet does not focus in certain areas access actually exacerbates inequality where inequality exists offline but there are good things still. 
Um, okay, so this quote as well is, is from Maha Bali, who was speaking earlier this year at OER17, which is a, an annual open education conference. And she, she's an Egyptian um, academic and uh, open knowledge activist, and she made a great point. Um, she's very, very concerned with access and openness and, and open practice. And she made a great point that actually we, we try constantly to be inclusive, a lot of us. It's not that we aren't trying and that we aren't concerned. We are in some ways set up to fail. That's the nature of actually being inclusive, that we do have to keep persisting, that we have to keep trying. And anybody who's actually worked in areas around inclusion will know how complex it is and how diverse groups that we neatly try to put into boxes actually are in the real world um, and how sometimes we can design in inclusivity for some people which actually designs out inclusivity for other people as well but the key point is we need to actually make that conscious attempt we need to try and we need to design for inclusivity and adding to that short version, reiterating, there are really great things about the internet. The, the, you know, there's, there's an amazing things that go online. Many people have uh, met their true loves, they've shared their family photos, they've you know, made re amazing research breakthroughs, they've connected to people that they would never have met if that wasn't there. They've learned things, they've seen things, oh, I'm having a bit of a blade run a flashback, that they would never have seen if it wasn't for the internet. Just wanted to bring you into that moment with me. Um, um, one of the great things, obviously, about the internet is Wikipedia. It, it is incredible. It's an incredible thing when you think about what has been achieved globally um, and what is still to be achieved globally, which is really, really exciting. Uh, you, uh, for those of you who've never heard of Wikipedia, it's a free online uh, encyclopedia that is community edited and, and attributed. So it's an encyclopedia, so which makes it not a body of knowledge, but a reference work to other bodies of knowledge. Um, the work on there is openly licensed, so it can be reused in different ways. Um, and it's not just about the text, it's also about language, about images. There are over 200 Wikipedias. This is the English language Wikipedia, which is probably the best known to most people in this room, but actually there are over 200 other language Wikipedias um, thriving, and many, many more to come as well, I hope. And Wikipedia is really important, not just because it's great, not just because it's an example of actually the kind of finest of humanity in terms of technology, but actually because it is part of everybody's daily life who is online. In the UK, it's uh, ranked eighth, and it's the only other uh, not-for-profit in that top ten, apart from uh, BBC is, uh, being the other one. Globally, you can see uh, the picture shifts, and within the top ten, you have um, China um, showing its presence. You have um, uh, uh, different countries coming in and influencing that. And if you look at the long list, um, the Alexia Web, Web rankings, is a really, really fascinating list, and they keep them up to date in real time. Um, you can find out what all these sites are, and you can see uh, you know, where things are. But Wikipedia is fifth in the world, globally. It's the fifth biggest site. And just let, let that settle in a little bit, what that actually means, and how powerful that is in terms of something that's created by us all and shared with the world to try and support access to knowledge for all. So, some of you will be really familiar with this, so my apologies, but some of you may not be as aware that Wikipedia itself is one of a number of projects. There's lots and lots of different projects in the Wikimedia family. So the Wikimedia family uh, foundation is the global organisation that sits behind Wikipedia and all of the other projects like Wikidata um, and supports and drives um, the communities that are creating those things. Um, I'm very fortunate to be the chair of Wikimedia UK. Um, it, it's an amazing organisation. I think we are um, doing incredible things. I'm very, very proud of the things that we're doing, not just as a staff, actually as a community. So people around the UK who are more or less connected to the organisation as well. Um, but we are basically the UK chapter of the global movement and we support Wikipedia and the other projects um, specifically in relation to the UK. 
We have a massively close partnership with the cultural sector, which is really important to us. Education is obviously a key theme, but there's a huge, huge overlap with those two sectors. And the focus for us in terms of the cultural sector is obviously in terms of making knowledge accessible, in terms of increasing online impact, and also um, looking at and supporting cultural and organisational change from uh, models that um, responded best to a time before digitalisation and the internet to models that actually uh, make the most of what the opportunities and potential is actually now. Um, and what does it mean to... What does open knowledge mean in this context? I'm going to just explore a little bit because um, I think it's a sprawling question. I don't think it's a question that's been answered yet. And, and I think that's partly why it's an important question because we are all part of that discussion. We're all part of discussions around inclusivity and access and how to support that and how to frame that. In terms of open resources, there's several ways of um, describing them. The probably most famous way is uh, David Wiley's Five R's of Openness, which is basically a uh, model that says if you can retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute uh, resources, they are open. And it defines that. And um, uh, uh, Cable Green, who's the education leader of Creative Commons, he describes that as free and unfettered access. The short version from the, the kind of international open definition is that open data and content can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose. So that's around kind of licensing. It's starting to look at kind of some of the technical restrictions. It's starting to look at some of the educational um, issues around there. But it exists... I think open licensing are a key important element within a field of activity. So open licenses by themselves will not support inclusivity to the extent that you want it to because of all of these kind of historic embedded things, all of these multiple barriers that people face and these difficulties. It takes design, it takes work to actually reach out. So open practice um, is a really interesting concept and one that's gained a lot of traction recently. I'm not going to try and define it here, but it is associated with these kinds of things. So yes, it's associated with Open, open resources of, of all kinds and licensing, but it's also concerned with accessibility, both in terms of specific disabilities, but also in terms of um, just being able to get to stuff online. And obviously there is issues around um, affordability of technology, there are issues around skills and um, uh, confidence in using and engaging with technology as well in that context. So, so the conversation around it is around these kind of things. I think sustainability is worth picking up and highlighting as a really, really important one because it very, very often gets overlooked. And in the context of what we're talking about today, which is actually making lasting changes to communities that can access and make use of resources, then sustainability is really important because you can have an amazing event you can have a brilliant workshop and the people that come to that amazing event and that brilliant workshop can really benefit. But, but what are you working within to make sure that that is sustainable, that you can reach more people, that, they can, that those people can be equipped to support others, that um, you as an institution or as an organisation can actually do more than one-off events, can actually seriously chip, start to chip away at, at those quite significantly deep entrenched social issues that actually take a long time to sort out and to address. I've included this because I think it's really interesting to anybody working in this space at a strategic level who's thinking around inclusivity and access. It's actually from the World Wide uh, Web Foundation and they've recently done a piece of work uh, around digital gender gap and one of the unfortunate things that they found is that most governments in the world are not doing anything in this area, particularly in terms of policy or actually not doing enough. Some governments are doing uh, quite a bit in all of these areas, but some governments are not doing as much. And... Um, this is basically a framework specifically to address the 
barriers facing women but actually uh, very very useful to kind of think through with lots of different groups and one of the key things I think behind this is their emphasis on working with and for women so women aren't a group over here that we need to work out how to include actually in the planning process in the inclusion process they need to be involved in that because otherwise we're not going to have the kind of reach that they want the framework that they've got includes rights, which is um, around protecting and en enhancing everybody's rights. Uh, not, not specifically women, children, women, uh, men, people who don't identify as any of those, protecting everybody's rights. Um, because without that, you can't actually um, have the kind of um, environment and framework that you need to move forward. In terms of education, it's about equipping people with the skills and confidence to actually engage with um, materials um, and also to use those materials too. I think the language that they use within this framework is really, really interesting and the emphasis that they're putting on things as a very active emphasis is a, is a lovely switch to some things. A lot of this will be very familiar to those of you who already have kind of strategic frameworks and it will be similar to some of the things that you are doing. I particularly like it because it's short, and I'm a big fan of short things. Um, access, they're describing as affordable access to the open web. And content, they're describing as content which is relevant and inspiring to those communities, which I think is a really interesting way of looking at it and focusing because if that content isn't interesting and empowering to those communities they're not going to spend very long um, engaging with it at all and their focus in terms of content is a content that is both available and content that is used so a focus again on how do we engage use which obviously really resonates with everybody here really really resonates with the mission of the British Library and the mission of British Library Labs and targets so this is really about how do we how do we keep moving forward but also how do we have accountability within those systems they're talking particularly about accountability to uh, from policy makers but obviously leadership accountability and organizational accountability are really really important as well this is another snapshot from mozfest um I've talked about how amazing Wikipedia is, and it is, it is incredible, and I don't want to diminish in any way the achievement that they've made, but we also are at the point where we're taking a long, hard look at ourselves and our communities. And this was a tweet from yesterday. Only 20% of the world, primarily white folks, are editing 80% of Wikipedia's content. Together we realise that most of our collective understanding is still being written by a minority. So there's a, lot, there's a lot in there to unpack, but I think the key thing is around the fact that if you are providing one of the world's premier knowledge sites, then you very much need to be interested in and making sure that the people who are creating that are the people who are going to benefit from that. And you have to work very, very hard, I think. And I think the new Wikimedia Foundation um, uh, strategic plan is, is really focusing on this to actually address the imbalances that are within that organisation to rebalance what the content is and how other people can engage with and understand um, themselves and their world through engagement with Wiki, with uh, Wikipedia. So uh, Wikimedia UK worked with the BBC recently towards the end of the year. So um, BBC have a 100 women season. They're just starting their new one this year. But last year it ended in December. And it ended with um, a big uh, international editathon event. Um, it was one of the highest numbers. It was one of the events that provided the highest ever numbers about um, entries about women in a single event with more than 400 new, new and updated profiles. This is just one example, though. There's lots and lots of editathons around this. So there's a feminist plus art movement that is. Um, globally looking at different aspects of art history and looking at redressing and rebalancing um, women's um, contribution um, to those fields. Um, and we need to do it, we need to make the effort. Just 14% of Wikipedia volunteer editors before this are female. That may have changed slightly uh, since the end of last year. And in terms of notable profiles, only 17% of notable profiles are women. 
So what that means is that the way in which women have been traditionally excluded from discourse around uh, excellence in many, many fields and achievement in many, many fields is currently being perpetuated within these kinds of frameworks. So it's really important. And I don't think it's not that men can't support this. I'm sure many, many men are supporting this and are helping out with this. But obviously, if we want to really address it, we need to get women involved as well as actively in the community as editors and in the host of other kinds of um, active roles that people can play. Wikimedia UK has had a big role and a big focus on um, residencies uh, as a form of engagement with the glam sector. So I'll just talk about that, um, the history of that briefly for those of you who aren't aware of that kind of programme and activity. So typically they're called Wikipedians in residence. Sometimes they're called Wikimedians in residence. It is basically the same thing, but obviously Wikipedians in residence tend to have more of a focus on that particular project than the projects as a whole. And we had the first uh, Wikipedia in residence globally in the UK um, at the British Museum in 2010. So that's something to be extremely proud of. And um, I, I love what Liam Wyatt said here in terms of that residency period. He said, we are doing the same thing for the same reason for the same people in the same medium. So let's do it together. There's a huge power, I think, in bringing those two communities together, the open knowledge community. So I'm not just talking about the Wikipedia community here. There's lots and lots of projects outside of Wikimedia um, that are um, run hosted, developed, built by extremely passionate people who really, really care about making culture and making knowledge accessible to other people. And they have the same hopes and ambitions that our cultural institutions have, but they don't always connect. And the, our first uh, Wikimedia in Residence project was here at the British Library in 2012. Um, and out of that came some fantastic work uh, around images of Canada um, and a lot of training for staff members and members of the public. This is a pretty messy diagram. And personally, I don't know whether I would put the Wikipedia in Residence at the centre of this diagram. I think it's a bit more of a dynamic relationship between all of the people. But what it illustrates really is that it is about the Wikimedia in Residence programme is about relationships and it is about building relationships across organisations, connecting them and also building relationships externally with both communities. So using your power together to actually build and benefit both communities. Um, there's a whole range of things that Wikimedia in, in Residence do. Um, and particularly, it's around establishing links between the organisations and open knowledge communities, providing professional development and capacity building for organisations. I think that's a really, really important one because if we're living in a place where Wikipedia is the eighth most visited site in the UK and the fifth most visited site globally, then anybody who is working in uh, communications, in knowledge, in digital, professionally, needs to have some understanding of how that works and how that might benefit them. Even if they don't become an editor, even if they don't um, take it up, as a knowledge professional, what, it, what, what we need to know has shifted now. And we do really need to be informed and confident about those things, even if we're not ourselves actively engaging with them. So just understanding more about how those things work is really, really helpful. Um, obviously, they're supporting a whole host of things in terms of what they're delivering, in terms of accessibility and development, outreach, profile raising, education programmes and inclusion programmes that can be supported at both a strategic level and at a very practical um, activity-based level. And I think key, increasing the use of collections for research, commerce, the arts, learning and teaching. And in terms of the British Library Labs Awards, you'll all be aware that these are exactly the kinds of things that, we're, that the British Library is interested in taking forward with its own collections to working to support people around. Um, sometimes 
there is tension around those kinds of things, especially in terms of commerce, because um, there is a tricky relationship, I think, between open knowledge and um, people taking those things to make money from them and people understanding of what open licensing is. And that might be something that you want to follow up and talk about. And the impact has been immense. So these things are great. Bluntly, bluntly speaking, the Wikipedians <coughs> in residence have had immense reach. So these are just some statistics about what we've been doing recently. National Library of Wales work um, has uploaded thousands of files and has <coughs> generated 334 million views. So it's, even in very, very blunt terms, we've had significant <coughs> impact. Um, little note on the welcome stats there, because the welcome stats, like many of our other projects, those have related to ongoing work and not just to the work of the residency. But um, we've, we're, it's an incredible contribution to those organisations to make their work much more accessible. There's also some in-use stats at the, at the end, and that's basically about reuse of those files. So people who have taken that work and are actually, uh, we know that they're, they, they're reusing it in different contexts as well. So it's not just that they're using it personally or they're viewing it or they're taking it, but they're actually, again, reusing it. And, and some of the licensing terms obviously enable that to happen. This Wiki Cymru is one of those projects that I was talking about before. It's one of the other Wikipedias. Um, it's, not, it's the Welsh Wikipedia. And um, the work, work that's been going on in Scotland and Wales, I think, is particularly notable um, just because it's been, it's been incredible. Um, England, we need to catch up because <laughs> they are doing amazing things. Not to say that we're not doing amazing things here, but um, especially over the last year, the work that they have done is incredible. They've, and, and this project I really love because it intersects gender issues and um, indigenous language and, and um, Celtic language issues as well, and particularly supporting um, the Welsh language. And they've actually addressed gender diversity in the Welsh Wikipedia. It has gone from um, June 2016, where women were notable biographies of women represented 32% of all entries. So it was, they were doing very well already, actually, compared to the kind of um, broader stats. But they are now, they're now over 50% in terms of representation. Um, and Robin's saying the, the number of biographies is now balanced, which is a big achievement for a small Wikipedia. And we now need to look at other facts, factors such as increasing the content of articles from being male orientated to be more balanced and gender neutral, which is throwing up kind of, again, next steps in terms of where we go. So it's great that we have got representation of groups that have previously been underrepresented, but actually we have a lot of different quite subtle content issues around how things are presented, which um, references are indicated around things, whose voice gets heard and whose voice doesn't get heard in these spaces. And that's a, that's a long, that's a big job. This year saw the appointment of the UK's first permanent Wikipedia, Wikimedian in residence at the National Library of Wales and the first Gaelic Wikimedian in residence um, at the National Library of Scotland. We've also got Wikimedians in residence at the Scottish Library and Information Council, and we held the first Celtic Not Wikipedia Language Conference um, in Edinburgh this year as well, which um, actually people from all over the world visited that because lots of people are interested in supporting indigenous languages and supporting the different kind, the different language Wikipedias, and working collectively to share knowledge and um, support around that. So I'm going to end there. I think what I've hopefully got across is something of the size of the, the and the complexity of the issues that are going on, but also positively the kind of point that we are now in terms of engaging with. Uh, those complex issues quite seriously and taking those issues quite seriously. Um, obviously, you can ask any questions you like, um, but these are questions that I'm quite interested in knowing as well, that I'm asking you if you would like to answer. I'd be delighted to hear your answers. Um, 
and really it's kind of a current future and concerns type question. So in what ways do you consider your practice to be open already? And I think that's quite an interesting thing to reflect on in terms of you may not be involved specifically in open licensing, but actually in terms of being an open practitioner or your practice being open or your institution's practice being open, actually, hopefully, I've kind of indicated that that's a broad field with many, many opportunities in as well. Um, what are your priorities? So in terms of you as an individual, you as an organisation, what are the priorities that you have and can they be motored forward um, by connecting to open communities and by um, uniting with those? And also, what concerns do people have about working in the open? Because um, working in the open is not, is not free. Working in the open is not without its risks and without its, um, and, and it can make people quite vulnerable sometimes in various ways. There are lots of issues around that that um, I think as a community we're now engaging with as well and starting to address. So it would be great to hear if people have concerns here today so we can kind of share our pooled knowledge about those as well. So thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for your generous presentation. Um, it was very inspiring. I didn't know about the uh, Wikimedia or the other open space. I'm representing curators or artists in this um, gathering. Uh, for me, as part of concern is uh, how we can protect our work when it goes that open. Because we have had so many problems when people film our uh, presentations and they put the video online when it shows our work which is actually commissioned by another institute. We don't have the right to show that that way in such a public platform but also we cannot limit that as far as we have pushed for it. So I think that idea of open is fantastic to reach as wider audience as possible but also how we can have those regulation in place that could protect our rights mm. as makers, as creative people. That's, that's what I wanted to. Yeah. Well, thanks for starting us off with a really complicated question. <laughs> it's always great to... Uh, I was being lulled then into a sense of uh, security, but we're back now in the fray of uh, the real world and the difficulties that people face. It's a huge question with lots of parts to actually unpack, I think. Firstly, it's about um, IP... IP knowledge and IP policy. Uh, who owns what you are doing? Is it you? Is it your? Um, is it your employer? Is it the person that you're working for a contract with? Um, I did a lot of work with schools quite recently, and one of the things that became very quickly apparent is that um, most educators in that setting, and I don't think it's confined to that setting at all. It's just that I've been working uh, a lot with schools recently don't understand basic IP issues. They don't understand the rights that their employers have and the terms of their contracts of work around those kinds of issues. And previously, that probably wasn't a problem as much, because if you're writing things um, and you're keeping things within an organisation and you're just sharing things quite locally, it's not that much of an issue. But actually, once you digitalise things, once you want to put them into the world, it becomes an issue. And it becomes something that people need basic knowledge of. And also that organisations have to think about in terms of, well, do we need to put policies in place? Do we need to do other things? One of the things that we did at Leicester City Council is that we gave blanket permission for all of our teaching staff to open licence their own work. So we retained the IT as an employer legally, but we said to them, you have that permission to do that. And in, in, in that way, you will have ownership over those things in the same way that other people have ownership in those spaces. And that's, in some ways, that's a big advantage of open things because you may not have the right, as teachers don't, and as many other employees don't, they legally don't have the right to take the work that they've created in one space to another space or from one employer to another employer. If things are openly licensed, actually, that undercuts and gives clear permission that they, as well as others, can use that work in the context that they want to use it in. 
So that's one kind of aspect. The other kinds of things that you're talking about uh, comes down also to, I think, this shift in technologies that we, quite, we haven't quite caught up with what it means around permissions, around etiquette, around whether it's OK to film people without their permission, if, is it OK to do things? And I think that's a road that we're only just getting started on. Um, some organisations and some places are better than others, but it, it tends still to come down very bluntly to, yes, you can use your camera, or no, you can't use your camera in most places, because we haven't really grappled with how that works, not just in terms of organisations, but I think as a society as well. And, and like the, the example that immediately springs to mind is pictures of people's children. It's a, it's a really tricky, tricky one. Pictures of your own children, pictures of other people's children is a tricky one because there are a layer of, poten potentially, depending on the context, there's a layer of legal concerns, but there are also privacy concerns, there are also ethical concerns, there are also safety concerns that overlap all of those kinds of things that need negotiating in a quite complicated way. Um, in terms of your question about kind of value to the creator in these spaces, it's a really tricky one to answer. One of the things that I'm looking at, and you probably won't be satisfied with the answer that I'm going to give you now, and I welcome your blog post response and, you know, or you pointing me in the direction of something else as well in terms of a dialogue around it. One of the things that I'm working on and thinking about a lot at the moment is um, data and content as infrastructure, not product. Now, that's very difficult for the artistic community, I think. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly different approach when you are making your living from your content. Um, from, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking at the moment about, well, how do we support businesses, entrepreneurs? How do we support activities around the use of data? And how do we help build on top of that for everybody's benefit? Um, it's a really difficult area, though, and I would welcome any of uh, other people's comments in this area as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask if your drive towards openness, which is excellent, um, includes uh, also a drive towards free and open source software, which, uh, of course, is equally important. Yes, and obviously the open movement owes, uh, the open knowledge movement owes a massive debt to the open software movement because obviously uh, when you trace back kind of definitions and, and, and ideas and encouragement, it comes from the open source software movement massively. So it's, it's very, very important. In terms of my kind of work and my career, my focus has been on open education. But that's not to say that I don't appreciate those other areas at all and, um, you know, want to give credit where it's due very, very much not trying to ignore the huge history and contribution that those people have made. I feel very privileged because I talk about open a lot and it's, you know, I'm totally building on so many people's work and contributions and everybody in the open movement is benefiting from that work that has gone before. Hi, uh, Josie. Thank you so much for that talk. It was really inspirational. Um, I w I'm one of the people who went to Mozilla Fest um, and it was my first time, it was great, I loved it. Um, and I also went to an open glam session that um, was organized by these lovely people from Museum Slovak. Um, and I think one of the things that came across to me is that, you know, because I've worked on various sort of digital research projects and cultural institutions, and it's sort of like all the people involved in that sort of stuff, we're all kind of, we're preaching to the choir. <laughs> And this is something that came up at the Open Glam session, and I think personally it's come across uh, in my own work, is that how do we get the people who aren't on board, which mm -hmm. to me is basically the central management of every big cultural institution, on board with these concepts of making access to data open, and that it's not gonna make the downfall of the whole institution. And I think there's a real lack of understanding what digital practices and digital innovation and how it doesn't have to be a scary thing. And um, just from personal experience, I feel like there's a lot of kind of pushback by organizations. And mm -hmm. I, I also was wondering from your perspective as being part of the DCMS, how you want sort of to support that in the sense of having publicly funded institutions making their data or their collections or whatever, um, actually 
available back to the public? Because I think that is actually part of the remit, but there's a lot of pushback <laughs> against that. So, sorry, a few loaded questions. Right. No, thanks. <laughs> um, one of the things I'd say is that I am very uh, working in kind of um, uh, governance and organisation. I'm very sympathetic and um, alert to the issues that are faced by big organisations. Very often, as people who are passionate about things, it's very, it, it seems very easy to us to make those changes from the outside. Actually, it's not that easy to make those changes. And, you know, very, very often, actually, we do have um, supporters and people who are very sympathetic working within those kinds of fields. So um, I'm a, a bit nervous around a characteristic of all organisations of being monolithic and not getting the web, because I think that a, a lot of them do. I think if you think about how regular people, and I use that term like advisedly, not us, the other people, the, the, um, the information civilians, yeah, how they kind of understand and interact with the world and how they understand the web, they, they're, they're playing catch up a lot of the time with what the reality of their lives are and what the issues are becoming and what they've previously considered. We've, we've been thinking about privacy. We've been thinking about licensing. We've been thinking about these kinds of things. Lots of those people haven't, and lots of those in that camp includes lots of people who work in organisations too, because they're not like weird aliens, they're just real people that are working in those situations. We are coming to a point actually though where we need socially to really um, get up to speed on a lot of those issues, because um, I'm thinking particularly around privacy. Um, the, there are a lot of serious issues that could uh, curtail rights and could um, exacerbate inequality that are coming up that we need to actually support those people who don't understand to understand what those things are and I don't think it's an easy it's not an easy mission mm -hmm. and also I think it's it's a longer term thing like I said about events you can't just do one thing and expect it we're actually trying to a lot of the time we're trying to bring about organizational change and that is not an easy or short-term thing, and there is no shortcuts to that because you have to take everybody with you, you know, not just senior management, not just um, enthusiasts, not just people who are terrified of the... Inter you have to take everybody with you together on that journey to make it effective and to make it a sustainable thing. So, no, sorry, no silver bullet answer for me. Um, in terms of your question about DCMS, obviously, slightly tricky for me to answer. I'm a civil servant. I'm there to support uh, the government of the day and um, support working through um, what we as a country benefit from within, within that area. So I'm going to dodge your question in terms of that. But come and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi. I, I also found your uh, talk very, very interesting. I'm here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Um, I, work, I work in the university sector, and my job involves uh, uh, supporting colleagues um, um, bring their research to the public, mainly through the galleries at the university. Um, obviously, there's, there's uh, a concern there that, um, I mean, if uh, that research, when it comes to research being assessed, uh, um, it has to go through particular channels, that um, uh, peer review channels and things like that. There's also concern about IP and um, um, how, how, how do you um, square that circle? I mean, obviously staff are very keen, the staff that I support are very keen that their research is known about, but at the same time, they're mainly publishing through rarely read um, mm. journals and mm. things like that. Yeah, I think um, LSE is a brilliant model at the moment for actually putting things online, for um, using open journals, for generating views through their use of social media. They've been very, very canny and they're worth definitely following in Twitter and other social media things because the approach that they've taken has massively increased public engagement with the research that they're doing. You know, it's been extremely effective in getting, in getting that message out. And it is a big cultural shift for them as well, again, from uh, a traditional model to a model that's actually focusing on their mission of making their, their research accessible and talked about and read. 
and by as many people as possible, which, you know, at the end of the day, we all want that for our work, however obscure our topic. We still would love lots and lots of people to be able to access it. I think the um, open publishing um, and open journal movement is developing and growing. There are more opportunities, obviously. There is a lot of issues around traditional publishing formats and how that works that I'm not going to go into here because... Um, there's probably some publishers in the audience. Uh, but um, I think it is really, really important to kind of encourage that. And again, I'd come back to this idea of what is a professional now? What is a professional academic now? And for me, it's somebody who actually understands the mechanism of getting research out there and using um, the web smartly to generate discussion around research, to engage people with that research and to highlight the visibility of that work to try and connect to others. Because a traditional connection model within academia is very limited and very um, elitist in many ways. Actually, now we've got a much better way of connecting not only with other academics, but actually other passionate amateur profession, um, interest people who are interested in that area and other people who want to kind of learn more about that area and share. Hi, Hi. Josie. Thank you very Hi. much for the presentation. Um, I'm a hugely avid user of Wikipedia or of Flickr through the Creative Commons images, and I enjoy it immensely, and I'm grateful that it's there. Um, obviously, these things have taken business of private companies, and uh, which in terms of image libraries and stuff, I'm personally not very concerned about them. But where I sometimes find it quite worrying and where I would like to get your thoughts on is uh, in news. Because obviously now um, some of the major news outlets, like whether that's the Times or the New York Times, they've made their journalism, they, you have to pay for it. You have to pay very little, but you still have to pay for it. And I think that's justified because the journalists, you know, you want good journalism, so you have to pay for it. And I found myself sometimes on Facebook or on getting into arguments with people who, for example, in a post from the New Scientists go, oh, don't even bother clicking, you have to pay for it. And I find that quite frustrating because why shouldn't you pay for a journalist? Because if you always expect that to be free, then how are these journalists going to you know, spend time to actually investigate properly? And how do you solve that problem with people expecting to get these articles for free? Thank you. I'm really loving the scope of questions today. It's really, really nice that we've got such a diverse and interesting audience here today. Um, obviously, the uh, journalism is going through a massive, massive period of disruption and renegotiation in terms of how it can make itself work. Um, there, there are all kinds of new initiatives coming up. You can't get anything for free. You can't get anything for free. Somebody is paying for it somewhere. So the BBC you get for free, but that's because of the licence fee and because of, um, of the money that goes into that organisation through, uh, through various ways, some of which are commercial, some of which um, are not. Um, you pay for those things that are free through adverts or you pay for those things that are free through selling your data effectively. So making, making a product for the provider that they can sell to advertisers to try and target you more effectively or to, to whatever it might be. So I don't think that what, you know, there are many, many models that are being tried out and paywall models are one of those models. And they're trying to figure out, lots of industries at the moment are trying to figure out, well, how can we manage to continue to deliver the quality of service that we want to do in a place where most people can access things um, freely, um, you know, and, and they are looking at paid access for specific things and, and a specific uh, quality of writing. It is a difficult field because it's not the case anymore that the authority and the quality of things resides only in those kind of paid for institutions. You can get those in other ways but you need to be aware that you're always paying for them somehow, um, in some way. The things that you're not paying for are obviously the community-based initiatives, and people are paying for those in terms of the time that they commit and in terms of the knowledge that they commit and in terms of the energy that they put into those things as well. Um, 
that we haven't got a model where everything is just open and, and some things aren't closed. We have a mixed model economy at the moment. I don't know how it's going to end up for the um, journalists um, community because that's not a community that I'm massively close to. Um, so I don't know how those things are going to play out for those them in the longer run. I am interested in kind of community-focused initiatives around that, and Jimmy Wells recently started a new um, a new project, uh, Wikinews project, around looking at addressing that and community sourcing um, balanced news uh, and providing that freely as well. So that's a really interesting initiative and model, which actually could threaten quite a lot of the existing providers if it if it does um, take off and if it is successful. I think in terms of licensing your things and then people selling those things, it's a really interesting question and it's not always appropriate to do that. So, for example, I remember a few years ago there was a big floor for, on Flickr with people who had openly licensed pictures of their children and then they found that those pictures of their children were being taken and sold by other people. So they were being put on mugs and, you know, here's your... And, and they were very disturbed by that and part of that was not because... Um, they were disturbed by the idea of open licensing. It was, I think, because they hadn't quite appreciated what an open license means and what permissions you're giving and the fact that, actually, no, it's not always appropriate to openly license things. And in situations where people are getting their work taken, obviously, if you're openly licensing something, you are, that is a commitment and a contribution you're making. And if somebody takes that work and makes money out of that work, you are letting them do that and you're kind of you're doing that in good faith as well. You there's nothing stopping you from doing the same thing and, and, and making money out of that as well. Obviously if somebody's taking your work and you haven't openly licensed it and they're making money out of it, well then send them a massive invoice. <laughs> Are we done? Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.